This is a story about power. The power to light and heat your home, cook your food, turn on your TV. It's a story about how that power is generated and transported through thousands of kilometers of cable to the sockets in your walls. But it's also a story of a different kind of power. Political power, economic power, market power. At its heart, this is a story about how something as essential to human life as energy has been transformed into just another way for private companies to make money. And how the merciless profiteering that transformation has enabled has left a whole country in the cold. This is the story of how energy privatisation bankrupted Britain. Greetings from the UK, where things are kind of just increasingly terrible, actually. Which maybe sounds like hyperbole, but let me show you a video. This is a clip from a British TV show called The Martin Lewis Money Show. Folks in the UK will be more than familiar with Martin Lewis. But for the benefit of international viewers, Lewis is a media personality best known for sharing tips and tricks to save money. Alongside his TV work, he runs a website called MoneySavingExpert.com, which maintains up-to-date lists of all the best bank accounts, credit cards and insurance deals, as well as providing pointers on state benefits, tax and how to get out of debt. Martin Lewis isn't perfect, but in the often murky world of financial advice, he's definitely one of the good ones. All guidance and zero grift. Which means that the bits of advice that he's sharing at any given moment in time can act as a useful barometer for the state of the British economy. If you use the Wayback Machine to browse Money Saving Expert as it appeared back in the heady pre-financial crisis days of 2007, for example, you'll find tips on how to get free gifts by switching credit cards, cheap package holidays, and interest rates of over 6% on your savings. So let's see what kind of advice Martin Lewis has been giving out lately, shall we? Now, this is a big one. Take my one degree challenge. The World Health Organization says 18 degrees is fine for healthy adults, younger, older or ill, you might need more. Who's got their thermostat on 18 degrees or less? Anyone in here? For anyone who didn't catch it, that's Martin Lewis updating Brits on how cold we can let our houses get before the World Health Organization says it becomes a risk to our health. So, yeah, things in Britain right now are not fantastic. In fact, to a lot of people, setting the thermostat to 18 degrees likely sounds like an opulent luxury. See, in November, inflation in the UK hit a 41-year high of 11.1%. This means that everything from cans of beans to boxes of space marines had gotten, on average, 11.1% more expensive over the previous 12 months. And while prices have risen across the board, the worst culprit has been energy bills. Just three years ago, the typical UK household paid £450 a year to cook their food, power their lights and keep themselves warm. In 2022, that figure rose to £2,500, which is money that a lot of people just don't have. Of course, energy prices have been rising across the globe. Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to a historic surge in the cost of gas and oil, which has swiftly been passed on to customers. During 2022, energy prices in the US rose 14.1%. Across the 19 countries that used the euro, that figure was 34.9%. But few countries came close to the UK, which saw energy bills jump a further 90% in just one year. Makes you proud to be British. <laughs> there are several factors which have allowed things to get so bad in the UK, all of which long predate this particular crisis. And there's one thread which ties them all together. Privatisation. 
Where most countries have some degree of private involvement in the energy sector, few have gone as far as the UK in opening up the entire system to companies whose primary concern is the extraction of profit. In today's video then, we're going to look at how energy privatisation has left many Brits unable to heat their homes. And in order to do so, we need to begin by turning our clocks back to 1986 and reacquainting ourselves with the princess of privatisation herself, the diva of deregulation, the noblewoman of neoliberalism, my friend and yours, Margaret Thatcher. Blimey! Things keep going this way. We'll be staring down the barrel of the one pound pint. Aye, aye. So, the story of energy privatisation in the UK begins with another TV clip. Jack, Jack. Sorry, Mike, you've got to go. These British gas sheds. It couldn't be easier to do. Phone his number and they send you information on how to apply. If you see it, tell him, won't you? Now, if you're watching this video from outside the UK, or if you're under the age of 40, or maybe even both, this weird little advert probably means nothing at all to you. But to a certain generation of Brits, the catchphrase, if you see Sid, tell him, is iconic. The ad is part of a marketing campaign, produced to publicise the privatisation of British gas. Until this point, British Gas had been a publicly owned corporation, responsible for supplying gas to any home or business in Great Britain which required it. You know, a lesser creator would have put a fart joke in here. In July 1986, however, the UK government, under the leadership of Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, passed legislation ordering its privatisation. And look, I know gas isn't the most exciting thing in the world, but this was a big deal. In fact, British Gas's flotation on the London Stock Exchange in December of that year was due to be the biggest initial public offering, or IPO, of any company ever. Oh. <laughs> it's just not very nice, is it? British Gas wasn't the first publicly owned entity to be privatised during Thatcher's tenure. The arms manufacturer, British Aerospace, half of the phone service provider, British Telecom, and the luxury car manufacturer, Jaguar, had all been sold off to private investors in the preceding years. It also wouldn't be the last. British Airways and British Steel, along with the country's electricity network, buses and trains, would all soon follow. There were three main motivations behind this string of sell-offs. The first was budgetary. Like all Conservatives, Thatcher was super keen on tax cuts for the rich. Over the course of her tenure, the top marginal income tax rate in the UK was slashed from 83% to just 40%. Corporation tax, that's the tax businesses pay on their profits, was similarly discounted from 52% to just 34%. Selling off a public asset or two was, in part, her way of covering the cost of these handouts to the rich. The second motivation was efficiency. Thatcher and her allies believed that privately owned companies were just inherently more efficient than those owned by the state. Further, in the case of industries like gas and electricity, privatisation opened the door to the introduction of competition. Rather than a single state-owned gas or electricity supplier simply telling you how much your energy bills would be, multiple companies would be forced to compete for your business, which, so the theory went, would lead to lower prices. We'll come back to that one, shall we? The third motivation for Thatcher's privatisations was purely ideological. She later wrote in her memoirs that privatisation was fundamental to improving Britain's economic performance, but for me, it was also far more than that. It was one of the central means of reversing the corrosive and corrupting effects of socialism. Others might have felt that it made sense for essential services such as energy, water and telecoms to be overseen by the government. This stuff is all pretty important after all. But to Thatcher and her allies, the existence of publicly owned utility providers was basically three steps away from opening up a gulag. 
In the case of British gas, Thatcher's desire to inoculate the UK against socialism was furthered by the particular approach that was taken to the sell-off. Rather than letting the company be gobbled up by institutional investors, the government set aside 40% of shares for individual members of the public. Any Brit who was interested could apply to buy a minimum of 100 shares for £1.35 each. Ah, one of my five a day. The goal was to promote in Britain a culture of what Thatcher's finance minister, Nigel Lawson, described as popular capitalism. The hope was that if more working class Brits could be encouraged to buy stocks and shares, then they'd feel they had more of a stake in capitalism as an economic system and therefore be less likely to vote for left-wing parties. Why can't we have nice drinks but in practical glasses? That's all I want. That's all I want in my life. The privatisation of British gas was seen as a way of catalyzing this culture shift. The Thatcher government poured £32 million into the so-called Tell Sid ad campaign, which became impossible to ignore. As one journalist put it, you couldn't pass a billboard, switch on the radio, or glance at your junk mail and miss it. And the campaign was a resounding success. 4.5 million Brits applied to buy shares in British gas, and when sold, it had the largest number of shareholders of any company in the world. Almost 40 years later, few who bought shares in British gas will have any complaints. By the end of the first day of trading, the value of each share had already jumped 9%. By 2013, it's estimated that those shares would have been worth almost 20 times what they were initially bought for. Which, you know, it's just nice to see some boomers get a win, isn't it? But this video isn't about the impact of energy privatisation on those who bought shares. It's about the impact on the country as a whole, and the millions more Brits who rely on British gas and its younger rivals for warmth hot food and energy. Because following the privatisation of the UK's electricity network a few years later, the entire UK energy sector has been in private hands. It's impossible to evaluate the impact of privatisation on consumers, however, without first having a basic understanding of how the energy supply industry works, how it was governed before privatisation, and how that changed when the industry was sold off. I keep getting drink in my moustache. Good morning. It's magic, I don't know how that's working. Now, the logistics of the energy supply industry are broadly the same worldwide. But given that this video is about the UK, I feel like it's only right that we should conjure up a suitably British scenario to ground ourselves in. So, it's Wednesday, and you've just been rudely awakened by the dustman. You've got a couple of hours left until your shift starts at the sarcasm factory, and so you give an understated nod to your portrait of Mr Blobby and head downstairs to make yourself a nutritious breakfast of beans on toast. But where does the electricity required to power your toaster and the gas required to fuel your hob come from? Well, the steps involved in both are threefold. The first step in getting electricity to your house is generation. This is the subsector of the energy supply industry which creates electricity in the first place. The UK generates electricity from a whole range of sources. Coal, gas, nuclear, wind, hydro, solar. Hopefully soon we'll be able to harness the power of the tabloid press's unending rage at anyone under the age of 30 doing, well, anything. The electricity produced is exactly the same whatever the source. But unless you can get it to your kitchen, then you're going to have to eat your toast raw. The next step then is what's called transmission. Transmission is the process of conveying electricity over large distances, 
usually the length and breadth of a country. If you've ever seen proper beefy steel electricity pylons like these, then you've probably been looking at part of your country's transmission network. In the UK, this is often referred to as the National Grid. Now, to stop too much energy being lost to heat and resistance along the way, electricity is transmitted at extremely high voltages. The flip side of this is that it's too high voltage for domestic use. If you hooked your toaster directly up to a transmission pylon, then your toast would probably be a bit crispy, and you'd probably be a little bit dead. Before it reaches your house then, electricity has to pass through a final stage of supply, distribution. From the high voltage transmission network, electricity is delivered to substations across the country, where it is stepped down to a lower, safer voltage for local distribution. If you've seen smaller wooden pylons like these out in the countryside, then you've probably been looking at part of a local distribution network. It's this distribution network which does the final task of delivering electricity to all the homes and offices and unaccountably large number of vape shops in your local area. Okay, so the electricity has reached your house and you've plunged your bread into the glowing crevices of your toaster. But what about your beans? Well, the gas supply network actually works pretty similarly. The first step here is production. Because the gas has to come from somewhere, right? And no, there will still be no fart jokes in this video. Around half of all gas used in the UK is extracted domestically from reservoirs beneath the North Sea. A further third is imported via pipeline from Norway, and the remainder arrives in liquefied form by boat from countries including Qatar, Russia, and the US. In being delivered to your house, gas also passes through a transmission network and a distribution network. The difference here, however, is not voltage, but pressure. Transmission networks pump gas across huge distances, which requires them to operate at extremely high pressures. From the high pressure transmission network, gas is then delivered to pressure reduction stations across the country, at which it is transferred to the much smaller, lower pressure pipes which make up the distribution network. And as with electricity, it's this distribution network which delivers the gas to your house and enables you to bring those big, beautiful beans to the boil. Ta da! Of course, as is kind of the point of this video, the gas and electricity which make your beans on toast so well toasty are not free. Operating alongside both of these technical systems then is the retail part of the industry, which is slightly confusingly often referred to as supply. The supply is more shirts and ties than boiler suits and hard hats. It's the part of the process in which someone looks over how much gas and electricity you've used in the past month and asks you to send over some cash to cover the cost. Now, as I've mentioned, these divisions between generation, transmission, distribution and supply are pretty much the same worldwide. Although obviously the electricity hums with the appropriate accent in each country. <laughs> importantly, these sectors can be owned and managed in many, many different ways. Prior to privatisation, the management of these systems in Britain was remarkably simple. Everything gas related across the whole country was operated by British Gas. They dealt with everything from maintaining pipelines to selling cookers to answering the phone if you thought you'd been overcharged. Electricity was a bit different. For one, Scotland had its own unique system separate from that of England and Wales. In fact, in order to keep things simple, we're going to largely ignore Scotland during the course of this video, which I'm sure any Scots in the audience will take extremely well. Oh, life must be so hard with your iron brew and your free prescriptions. In England and Wales, the industry was essentially split in two. All generation facilities, as well as the operation of the high voltage transmission network, were the responsibility of a body called the Central Electricity Generating Board, or KEGBA. Everything downstream of that was run by a group of 12 area electricity boards. 
These each operated the distribution network for a given region and handled billing for anyone living within their patch. For an average beans on toast enjoyer like you, this was a pretty good deal. All you had to do was pay up at the end of the month. That simplicity also meant cost effectiveness. In the 10 years prior to privatization, the price of electricity had been decreasing in real terms. But what use is simple when it's not creating any shareholder value? When British gas was sold off in 1986, things initially remained pretty similar. The entire corporation was sold off as a single company. On top of this, investors were promised a grace period of 25 years, in which British Gas would remain the only company authorised to sell gas to British homes. When it came to selling the electricity industry four years later, however, the Tories picked the whole thing up by the scruff of the neck and chucked it headfirst into a wood chipper. Metaphorically, of course. The most significant change was the breakup of the CEGB. Oh, not Kekaba. The board's generation activities were divided between three newly minted companies National Power, PowerGen, and Nuclear Electric. It's real kind of like pretend video game company vibes. The running of the transmission network, or National Grid, was given over to a further company, the even more imaginatively named National Grid Company. The 12 area electricity boards were each privatised as separate businesses. Each retained its dual responsibility for both operating its local distribution network and acting as the retail supplier to homes within their area. Like British Gas, these companies were also given a grace period, during which they would remain the sole electricity supplier for homes within their region after which they would be free to compete with one another and any new companies entering the market to woo customers across the country. As I've mentioned, the argument given for this restructuring was that this new, privatised system would force everyone involved in the energy supply industry to be more competitive, more efficient, more ruthless in their dealings with one another, and that this would, in turn, lead to cheaper beans on toast for everyone. At least the cooking bit. But it didn't take long at all, before the pursuit of short-term profits and increases in stock prices began to encourage not just profiteering, but also some downright disastrous decision-making. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that all this chat about the 1980s and 90s seems a little remote. Thatcher won! Get over it, Tom! But many of the structural vulnerabilities which have caused energy prices to spike so significantly in Britain over the past year are the result of attempts at corporate penny-pinching which took place in the very earliest days of privatisation. And they're all to do with how our electricity is generated. When England and Wales' existing power stations were sold off in 1991, the government also opened up the generation sector to full market-based competition. In theory, you could now ring round your mates, put your spare change together and found your own electricity generation company. In practice, however, you almost certainly wouldn't have. And not only because you just discovered this new thing called a Game Boy and were too busy trying to save Princess Daisy from Tatanga, See, at privatisation, the vast majority of England and Wales' electricity generating capacity was handed over to just two companies. National Power controlled around 52% of the market, whilst PowerGen accounted for 33%. The sheer size of these companies made it seem nigh on impossible for any newcomers to compete. More fundamentally, power stations are super expensive, take ages to build, and are subject to ever-changing regulation. You can put huge sums of money into building an innovative new facility which generates electricity from children's screams, but by the time it's complete, a new government might have been elected which wants to phase out scream energy in favour of powering the city with children's laughter. In short, to get into the electricity generation game, you've got to really, really want it. Fortunately, there was one group hanging around in the early 1990s for whom the potential benefits of getting into generation did outweigh the costs. At 
that privatisation, the former area electricity boards had been rebranded as regional electricity companies. And for these wreckheads, National Power and PowerGen's duopoly over generation was frustrating for a different reason. The RECs needed to buy electricity to sell to their customers. Only having a choice between two vendors thus placed them on the back foot when it came to negotiating prices. Nevertheless, a solution to this predicament would soon blow in on the wind in the form of natural gas. The technology needed to generate electricity from natural gas had been around since the 1940s. Yet policymakers in the UK had tended to see it as a slightly unreliable energy source. This was because, unlike coal, gas mostly had to be imported. And the price of those imports had a tendency to spike in instances where, for example, a war kicked off and a major gas exporting country stopped, well, exporting gas. Nevertheless, the business people were in charge now, and while gas might not be a great choice in terms of energy security, gas power stations are quick to build and cheap as hell. You can build a gas-fired power station for less than a third of the cost of a coal-fired station with the same capacity and around a quarter of the cost of an equivalent nuclear facility. In these low startup costs, the regional electricity companies saw an opportunity to free themselves from their reliance on the legacy generators. And they ran with it, throwing up their own gas-fired power stations left, right and centre. In 1990, just 1.5% of the UK's electricity was generated from gas. Just five years later, it was 18%. By the end of the decade, gas-fired power plants were generating 38% of all electricity generated in the UK. This all had two main outcomes. The first is that the UK is desperately reliant on gas. Even with the rise of renewables, natural gas remains the single biggest source of UK electricity by quite some way. Couple this with the fact that 86% of British homes also use gas for heating, and you can begin to see why spiking gas prices have had such an acute effect on the UK. Yet, it also led to a fusion of the generation and supply sectors of the country's electricity industry. One of the stated goals of privatisation had been to break the industry up so that generators and suppliers would have to negotiate with one another. As the regional electricity companies began to enter the generation game, however, that free market vision began to fade. In its place were a handful of extremely powerful generator suppliers with little motivation to reduce prices. We'll come back to how the creation of these new energy giants has enabled rampant profiteering shortly. But first, we need to take a brief look at a slightly different type of corporate cash cow in the form of transmission and distribution. But before we go any further, if you're a long-term viewer, then you'll know that there's few things that I love more than a good bit of cultural analysis. And the creator whose insights have been most enthralling me over the past few weeks has been the legendary Anita Sarkeesian in her new Nebula original series, That Time When. That Time When invites us to take a fresh look at some of the key cultural events of the 20th century. From the Hollywood blacklist, to the satanic panic, to Gamergate, each of the nine episodes is a brilliant dissection of a particular cultural moment. The series is fun, slickly made, and most importantly, a genuinely excellent work of cultural history. I thought I knew a fair bit about some of the topics that Anita places under her microscope, but with each and every one, I came away having learned something new and with a slightly different perspective, both on what happened and why that event still matters today. That Time When is just one of a whole number of brilliant original titles available on my streaming service Nebula, which is kindly sponsoring today's video. Every month we're adding more and more early access and exclusive content from your favourite creators and others who you might not have discovered yet. Alongside all that additional content, Nebula also allows you to watch my videos completely ad-free. That includes sponsor integrations like this one. 
Which means that if you were watching this video on Nebula, then you'd already be on to the next section by now. One major new addition which we're really excited about is Nebula Classes. Nebula Classes is a whole new section of Nebula included in every subscription, in which creators don their best teaching hats and lift the lid on some of the skills and expertise that goes into the making of their videos. This ranges from Patrick Willems taking you step by step through his approach to analysing a movie, to Sam from Wendover Productions letting you in on his best practices for persuasive communication. At some point in the near future, it might even feature a little something from yours truly too. Now if you're interested in getting access to this treasure trove of video goodness, then I'd be super grateful if you do so by using my personal link nebula.tv forward slash Tom Nicholas. Using that link allows you to get access to Nebula for a discounted price of just $2.50 a month, which is frankly a steal if you ask me. Further, if you are kind enough to use that link, you not only get access to all that exclusive content plus Nebula classes, it will also send a chunk of change my way to help me fund future videos like this one. Being part of Nebula has been a real game changer for my work and really does make a huge difference in how ambitious I'm able to be with my videos. So if you want to get access to all that great stuff while supporting my channel, then you can head over to nebula.tv forward slash Tom Nicholas. Or if you will insist on sticking around here, I guess we'll get on with the video. As we've seen, a focus on short-term profits over long-term strategy in the generation of electricity has caused some pretty big problems for the UK. Nevertheless, the involvement of private companies in generation is a fairly widespread practice worldwide. What marks Britain's energy industry out as a particularly radical experiment in privatisation is the complete and total sell-off of its transmission and distribution network. As things stand, Britain is one of only two countries in Europe with a fully privatised transmission grid. The other is Portugal, which was forced to sell off its high voltage network in the wake of the financial crisis. When it comes to electricity distribution, the UK is among a tiny handful of countries in the entire world to have a fully privatised system. Even in the United States, the spiritual home of free market capitalism, nearly 50% of distribution networks are owned by local governments. The reasons for this are twofold. Firstly, ensuring that gas and electricity are getting to the places that they need to go are just super important. At risk of sounding like I'm about to start some kind of liver king manfluencer arc, we're actually pretty reliant on these fuels. A power outage doesn't just mean that your Skeletric set stops working, it could easily lead to a major humanitarian crisis. And worse, it might affect businesses. Allowing your electricity grid to be bought and sold by investors then is kinda sketchy. In 2021, for example, a chunk of Portugal's electricity transmission grid got bought by a Mancio Ortega, the founder of Zara. And being what one corporate blog euphemistically called a cost optimization leader is one thing if you're running a clothes shop, but it's quite another when you're getting a say in the running of a vital piece of national infrastructure. To make matters worse, Ortega is only the second largest shareholder in Portugal's transmission network. The largest is the State Grid Corporation of China, a company ultimately owned by the Chinese government. Now whatever your thoughts about China, if you're a country, then allowing another country's government to have any influence at all over your ability to turn the lights on seems, at best, not ideal. The second reason that governments have tended to keep their transmission and distribution networks in-house is that these networks are what economists call natural monopolies. By this, they mean that the practicalities of these sectors makes the introduction of open, market-based competition all but impossible. 
It would require having multiple networks of pipes and wires running alongside each other, turning the country into a horrible, wiry, pipey mess. Even if that were allowed, the cost of building an alternative gas or electricity network would be so unthinkably huge that no company would want to in the first place. All of this means that privatised transmission and distribution networks are ripe for profiteering. Without heavy regulation, the companies which own them could demand huge sums for their use. To this aspect, the UK supposedly has a solution in the form of a government regulator called Ofgem. Part of Ofgem's role is to sit down with transmission and distribution companies and negotiate price controls. The goal is for these price controls to enable each company to make just enough profit that they remain motivated to invest in maintaining their networks without making so much that it needlessly drives up bills. Now, since privatisation, the UK's gas and electricity networks have each changed hands several times. Since 1995, National Grid, the company, has been entirely independent of the electricity suppliers, and since 2002 has owned not only the electricity transmission grid, but the gas transmission grid too. Distribution of both fuels is now also largely independent of the suppliers and run by a handful of specialist companies. To their credit, these companies are pretty good at their jobs. Power cuts in the UK are extremely rare. What they're even better at, however, is deploying small armies of lobbyists and lawyers to fight regulators at every corner and ensure that they're able to leverage their monopoly status to make outrageous profits. In fact, since privatisation, gas and electricity distribution have become the two most profitable industries in the UK. The average UK company makes a profit of between 9% and 15% depending on the industry in question. As of this year, however, the figures for the gas distribution companies was 36.6%. Well, the electricity distribution companies recorded average profit margins of 43.1%. Like, for the avoidance of doubt, those are ridiculous numbers. This has allowed these companies to make huge payouts to their shareholders. Between 2017 and 2022, the gas and electricity distribution industries paid out more than £6 billion in dividends. In the same five-year period, National Grid paid shareholders almost £9 billion. These handouts to foreign investors such as BlackRock, Mitsubishi and Warren Buffett are all ultimately paid for by ordinary Brits in their energy bills. In fact, if there's an argument to be had that privatisation promotes efficiency, then the example of Britain's transmission and distribution networks suggests that it's mostly a case of increasing the efficiency with which the super-rich can extract money from the rest of us. Before we come to any too sweeping conclusions, however, let's complete our journey down the energy supply chain by examining the wild, wild world of energy bills themselves. As I mentioned earlier, one of the key motivations for privatising the UK's energy sector was to enable the introduction of consumer choice. Rather than simply being told how much their energy bills would be by their local gas and electricity boards, the vision was that Brits would get to pick between many competing suppliers, and that this would, in turn, force those suppliers to reduce their prices. This idea, that competition leads to lower prices, is textbook economics, high school level stuff. The problem is that the real world is very much not a textbook. And for very different reasons, both energy suppliers and their customers have remained almost impressively uninterested in embracing this new creed of competition. For their part, energy suppliers have tended to look for somewhat less generous ways of gaining new customers. Initially, this meant simply plotting to buy their competitors out. When the industry was first privatised, there were essentially 15 energy suppliers in the UK. 
England and Wales as 12 regional electricity companies, two Scottish suppliers and British gas. And for a time, the UK government retained what's called a golden share in these companies, which gave it veto power over any corporate takeovers. In 1995, however, the Conservative government of John Major made the decision to relinquish this last vestige of public ownership. What followed was like something from Battle Royale, or The Hunger Games, or Fortnite, or Call of Duty Warzone or energy companies instantly began buying and merging and taking over one another. When the dust settled, those 15 companies had been reduced to just six. Not exactly a victory for the expansion of choice. That's the same number of friends in Friends. Unless you count like Gunther or, or, or someone. Maybe I should just have a Friends channel. Of course, this might not have been such a problem had privatisation also led to a wave of new suppliers bursting onto the scene. In 1998, the grace period in which the regional electricity companies were the only companies allowed to sell electricity within their designated region came to an end. This at the same time as British Gas lost its nationwide monopoly on the sale of gas. The sale of energy to the public was now officially an open market. The problem now lay in customers. See, the theory that competition inevitably leads to lower prices assumes that consumers are constantly pumped at the idea of seeking out a good deal. For many older people, the idea of choosing your energy supplier made about as much sense as choosing your star sign. Which is ridiculous, because we all know that they're personally assigned to us by Jesus. Others just have more important stuff going on. Jobs to go to, clothes to wash, beans on toast to eat. When given the opportunity to choose their energy supplier then, most Brits' response wasn't to thank their Lord and Saviour Milton Friedman for another expansion of the free market, but to kind of just ignore it. In fact, in the 25 years since the introduction of competition, the number of people switching energy suppliers in the UK has never totaled more than 20% of customers in a single year. The result has been that the so-called Big Six energy suppliers have remained, well, large. It took until 2015 for the collective market share of all non-Big Six suppliers to cross 10%. At time of recording, the legacy providers still serve more than 70% of British homes, with the majority of the remaining 30% being served by just one younger competitor. Attempts to break the stranglehold these companies have on the industry have kind of been more trouble than they're worth. In 2014, Ofgem relaxed its regulations to make it easier for new, smaller suppliers to enter the market. This led to a wave of absolutely tiny retailers bursting onto the scene. These companies were the polar opposite of the big six. They were dinky operations with very few employees and had what can only be described as school project energy. They pretty uniformly had stupid names, worse websites and logos that were borderline crimes against graphic design. The real problem, though, was that their business models were incredibly precarious. The legacy suppliers all owned their own power stations. Where they needed to buy gas or additional electricity, they were large enough to negotiate predictable, long-term contracts. The newer, smaller companies, by contrast, were forced to buy energy on the last-minute spot market, which is not completely unlike eBay for energy, which is a bit like the spot market, but for things. When wholesale gas prices began to rise in mid-2021 then, many of these smaller companies found themselves in a bit of a pickle. They'd agreed to sell energy to customers at prices that were lower than they were able to buy it for. And they began dropping like flies. Since the beginning of 2021, more than half of UK energy suppliers have gone bust. Of the 24 which remain, it's estimated that over half of them are technically bankrupt already and holding on by the skin of their teeth. This lack of meaningful competition has had a predictable effect on prices. Even before the recent increases in the wholesale cost of gas, energy suppliers had been steadily ratcheting up prices. 
Outside of the global oil shocks of the 1970s, the average price of electricity consistently went down under nationalisation. Adjusting for inflation, the average Brit was paying 36% less to turn the lights on in 1990 than they were in 1946. Far from driving down prices, attempts to introduce competition to the market have actually reversed that trend. Between 1998 and 2019, the average domestic electricity rate increased in real terms by a whopping 80%. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent spike in wholesale gas prices, energy bills in the UK have risen even further, at a ridiculous rate. In 2020, the average annual UK energy bill was around £450. By 2022, it was £2,500. And in 2023, it's expected to be a full three grand. Worse still, these final couple of figures would be even higher were it not for the government's introduction of a price cap. This will see the UK government hand over up to £140 billion in subsidies to energy suppliers to ensure that ordinary Brits can turn the heating on. Far from Maggie Thatcher's dream of an energy industry in which the free market drives down prices then, what we've ended up with is one in which the government is panding private companies cash by the bucket load. So there is a lot of anger in the UK at the moment about soaring energy bills. It's hard to see how anyone could not be angry. On the one hand, we have people being forced to make a choice between heating and eating. On the other, we have energy companies such as Shell and Centrica, which owns British Gas, announcing record profits. Much of the media conversation around the topic has framed this current crisis as an exceptional phenomenon. And there is much about it that is unique and hopefully temporary. But when we take a longer view, it becomes obvious that the price gouging and profiteering we're currently seeing is only really a more concentrated, shameless version of practices that have just become routine. 25 years since the UK completed its transition to a privatised energy sector, the data is clear. All else being equal, energy prices consistently went down under public ownership. Under privatisation, we've just had to come to expect that they will rise year on year. If we want to get energy prices back under control in the long term, that can only happen by bringing the sector back into public ownership. In 2016, a professor at the University of Greenwich, David Hall, estimated that renationalising the energy sector would cost in the region of £24 billion. Pounds, which initially sounds like a lot. I mean, it's probably about 24 billion cans of beans. More if you go own brand. But it is far less than the government is currently spending in subsidies to keep the facade of competition alive. If we take into account the ongoing savings, which would be made by not paying out all those dividends to foreign investors, it's basically a no-brainer. It's not even a particularly controversial policy. Polling for Servation in 2022 found that even 62% of Conservative voters are in favour of energy nationalisation. But it's not only because it would save money or because it is popular that public ownership of the energy sector just makes sense. As we've seen, placing these key aspects of a country's infrastructure into private hands opens up all kinds of risks with regards to energy reliability and security. It's also an ongoing hurdle in the transition to a zero carbon future. Under privatised systems, governments are forced to set up all kinds of incentives and subsidy schemes to strong arm energy companies into adopting greener practices. Under a publicly owned system, all that would be unnecessary. We could just like do it. But as important is the manner in which a return to public ownership might change the way in which we think about energy. Doing so might help us to once again recognise that the ability to light and heat one's home, to cook food, and even to watch hour-long YouTube videos about energy privatisation in the evening 
is not a commodity, but a human necessity, and that the provision of the means to do so should be a public service and not a vehicle. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that it's been worthy of your time uh, and that you've hopefully learned something new, uh, maybe a few things along the way. Uh, and yeah, if you know of anyone else who you think also might like to learn something new about energy privatization and its opposite and consequences, then uh, I'd be super grateful if you would share it with them um, or on any kind of online communities that you're part of. Um, sharing the sharing videos is always really, really helpful. Um, I want to say a big, big thank you as ever to um, everyone that supports me on Patreon, uh, among whom are Richard, Alan Gann, Gary, Dickon Spain, Bill Mitchell, Al Zweigart, ZC Reese, Alexander Blank, Neil de Bildgard, Sophia R, Sergio Suarez, Nicholas Jacquemart, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Amit Singh Paraha, Parker Mead, Karen Rosenau, Gabriel Koch, Demelza, Jimmy Dunn, Christopher Cowan, TK Loving and Alejandro Nikolai. Um, all of those people are signed up to the very top tier. Um, if you would like to uh, join them or people on the not so top tiers um, and in getting early access to videos, uh, copies of scripts, um, director's commentaries where I talk a bit about the um, process of making videos and weekly updates on what I'm working on and how things are coming together. And then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash forward slash forward slash Tom Nicholas. And that support is uh, always massively uh, massively appreciated but thank you so so much for watching once again uh, and i'll see you in the next video